Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's uh, program. My name is Mark Livingood. I'm director of the Story Center at Mid-Continent Public Library. And tonight's program is Missouri's Dynamic Quilting Traditions and Innovations. For the next year, the Story Center is partnering with the University of Missouri Extension's Community Arts Program to offer a series of programs that commemorate the Missouri Bicentennial. Called State of Stories, this series of free public programs features storytelling performances and workshops, book conversations and humanities programs, such as tonight's, that explore the history and culture of the Show Me State. Funding has been provided in part by the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation and the William T. Kemper Foundation. Tonight, we're joined by Dr. Lisa Higgins, Director of the Missouri Folk Arts Program, and Dr. Michael Sweeney, Coordinator of the Missouri Bicentennial for the State Historical Society. Welcome to you both, and thanks for being here. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Um, Michael, we yeah. have you talking about the Missouri Bicentennial Quilt, and then uh, yeah. Lisa uh, to talk about uh, quilting traditions from across the state. And for all of you out there, uh, we encourage you your questions at the end of the presentation. So, Michael, again, thanks right. for being here. And um, here we go. Take it away. All righty. Let's get this going. Okay. Well, my, my thanks to uh, you, Mark, and Lisa, and the Story Center for this opportunity to, to present about the Missouri Bicentennial and the role of the Missouri Bicentennial quilt has sort of played in all of this. Um, as Mark mentioned, I am with the State Historical Society of Missouri and serve as their Bicentennial Coordinator. Um, by way of background, the State Historical Society got involved in the Bicentennial back in 2013. We've been asked by the Missouri General Assembly to uh, take a leadership role and, and, and come up with ideas and plans and kind of move the commemoration forward. Uh, to get that going, the Society held a series of focus group meetings in 2014 and 2015 uh, to get a sense of what people were interested in. So certainly in Columbia and Jeff City, but also Cape Girardeau and Hannibal and Springfield and St. Joan and Roundabout to get a again, sort of to get a feel for what people were interested in. A number of things came out of that, those, those focus groups that were sort of principles that guided the way we treated the Missouri Bicentennial. One, we realized we wanted to do something truly statewide. Uh, we wanted to find something that would engage every single county in the state, since for the most part, kind of the bigger things in the state tend to happen along the I-70 corridor. So Kansas City, St. Louis, and maybe Jeff City, Columbia. So our goal was to come up with a number of projects, programs, and events that could include and engage folks in all of, all of our different counties. Um, number two, we wanted to find some way to small d democratize participation, right? Uh, that if people wanted to find a way in to engage with the Bicentennial, we had enough different options uh, that people could find a way. Number three, we wanted to maintain some level of local control because one of the things we heard was, hey, I don't need the state coming in here telling me how to do a Bicentennial. Uh, so with that in mind, we tried to structure things so that, that people could use the commemoration to articulate kind of local, local difference. Uh, but with that, kind of the, the, the fourth big thing was to find a way to promote the local without being parochial. Um, rather than focus exclusively on, on the diversity of the state, what makes our communities all different, or focusing just exclusively on sameness, we tried to spend and create projects that brought us together and, and thought of, had us think about shared somethingness, if you will. Uh, and then the last one was to focus in not just on the past, and I say this as a guy speaking for the State Historical Society, but to focus also on the present and the future um, of the state. And all of this came together in the mission statement we came up with for what we're calling Missouri 2021, and that's this. Uh, we think the bicentennial is this occasion to promote a better understanding of Missouri's uh, communities, counties, regions, people past and present. Again, hopefully with this idea of thinking about some, some sense of shared somethingness, um, this idea of sort of getting to know your neighbors better. For a state that is in many ways very fragmented, both geographically and culturally, how can we use this moment to, to help um, build some new bridges across, uh, across the state? And so a number of, like I said, we wanted to come up with a number of projects that would engage the community and uh, with lots of different options. Some of you who are familiar with us uh, knew, know we did a photograph project, we had some documentation initiatives. But one of the things that really stood out as, as a possible option was doing a quilt. Um, a number of other states had recently celebrated their bicentennials um, and quilts sort of featured in as a major part of that. Um, my own engagement with quilts has come from, from fabric artists and, and textile artists that, that I've gotten to know. Um, and it seemed like a good way that we could pull in lots lots of folks uh, since quilting has been such a piece of Missouri history, life, and, and culture um, long in our past and, and very much in our present. Um, of course, 
if you, if there's any colders in the in the audience out there, uh, most of you are probably familiar with Missouri Star Cold Company up in Hamilton, Missouri. Um, that has done an amazing job of, of you know, um, I think um, promoting the Hamilton economy and and sharing its its uh, resources across the state, and they certainly bring in a national audience. Um, so I, knowing nothing, little to nothing about quilts, needed to go find someone who knew a lot about quilts. Um, I was very blessed uh, to uh, meet uh, Courtney Hughes, who was um, at the time the director of um, their in in town education program, and Mary Bennett, who. Um, was um, sort of you know, overseeing uh, public relations and marketing. Um, I met them and, and asked the question, hey, would Missouri Star Quilt Company be willing to team up with us to uh, to work on this project? Um, the three of us sort of hatched out how this might work. Um, and the idea was that we wanted to try get one quilt block that could represent every county in the state. Um, we thought long and hard about what that block should be and came to the conclusion that it might be best just to leave it up to the counties to see what what they might send in. As opposed to, I, I believe it was Indiana that had uh, everyone do barns. And I, I've seen other quilts that were lets everybody do flowers. Uh, we left it up to the submitters to use their creativity and create blocks that shared some aspect of that county's uh, history, life, and culture. Uh, we accepted uh, submissions um, through 2018 and 2019. Um, I've got a few here on, on the, the screen that we received for Jackson and Clay County, um, just to give you a sense of some of the stuff that came in. Uh, ultimately, we received 203 uh, block submissions from 91 different counties um, and just spanned the different, all kinds of different uh, content and style um, and level of craft, um, but all in, in various ways representing uh, unique aspects of the, the county's um, culture and history. Um, you can see, you know, here for Jackson County, the example of seeing Liberty Memorial. Um, Robin Craig's um, block to represent Jackson County pulls in the Santa Caligon uh, and barbecue and Harry Truman and, and symbol for the Osage. Um, so, you know, like I said, a wide variety of, of styles that came in. Um, when we got to the end of the submission period, uh, Courtney Hughes um, served as one of the judges. We also reached out to Missouri State Quilters Guild. Juanita Minor um, served as one of those judges as well. And then we had a judge from the State Historical Society. Not me. I did not want to be involved in judging at all because I knew I was going to be meeting a lot of these folks. Um, so I did not participate in the judging. Uh, but these th but three folks um, settled on um, which blocks. For the most part, for about half of the counties, uh, we received only one submission. But for the other half, we received two, three. Um, Texas County and Ray County sent us in the most blocks. I believe there was 10 submissions for each of those counties. Um, and so from that, they, they picked a block to represent um, every county in the state. Uh, over the winter of 2019-2020, Courtney Hughes and then Julia Burkus, uh, Burkness, also at Missouri Star Quilt Company, their director of human resources, um, undertook the work to stitch the entire quilt together. Um, gave it its backing. Uh, Missouri Star Quilt Company donated the labor uh, to put the quilt together, and they donated the materials to, to put the quilt together. So the backing and um, all of the the, uh, the various little uh, corner squares and all the rest, they they donated all of those those materials. Um, and all of this came together in the final product, which you see here on the screen. Um, I've also included uh, a few other submissions that we received for Clay County, Jackson County, and Platt County um, on the screen there as well. Um, the entire quilt uh, includes 121 blocks, as I mentioned, so one for every county in the state and the independent city of St. Louis. Uh, and then there's six special blocks to help square the quilt out. Uh, for the most part, these blocks are in geographic location. Of course, it's not a square state, uh, but so mostly in geographic location. And so therefore, it becomes kind of a learning tool as you go through it and look at the various pieces um, to kind of learn a little bit about where some things are. Uh, the six special blocks include um, are, are there primarily to thank our sponsors and partners. Uh, so Missouri Star Quilt Company's uh, block up in, in the um, upper left quadrant uh, is near Caldwell County. Uh, the State Historical Society is represented by a bluebird, kind of there in about the middle near Cole and Boone County. Um, Missouri State Quilters Guild um, is represented in um, the bottom right um, side of, of, the, of the quilt. Um, since they're sort of headquartered there in, in, in Franklin County. Um, also near um, 
The Cole County block is a block to represent the Missouri governor's mansion, to represent our chief executive uh, in the state, and then a block for Missouri Division of Tourism that's helping us spread the word about um, about the, the quilt tour. Um, we're working very hard to get the quilt to as many locations as we can across the state. Um, of course, COVID-19 has, has made that a very difficult um, endeavor, but we are continuing to do so. Um, as I mentioned early on, what's been really exciting about the quilt is just the tremendous variety of content um, that we received, and I think what the quilt um, demonstrates about the state. Um, I've got four examples here that I want to mention to you. The one from Juanita Bridges, representing Greene County, is a very traditional um, kind of court of, um, of quilt block, uh, beautifully skilled and, and crafted together. Um, but also very abstract when it comes to, to talking about Greene County. Uh, very similar to the block we received for Osage County from Linda Roberts. Um, Linda Roberts gave a, a really nice description of the blocks, you know, talking about the four blue blocks that represent the four rivers um, that um, are connected with Osage County. So the Missouri, the Marys, um, the Gasconade, and the Osage. And then the two cross beams are for the two railroads, the uh, Pacific and the Rock Island, uh, that help settle the county. Uh, but then some of them are very, you know, um, representative, right? So they, they're very figurative. And so um, Virginia Smith's block for Dunklin County um, is a good example of this. Um, Dunklin County, for those of you who don't know, is down the boot heel, uh, former swampland. Uh, and then the early 20th century, um, I guess the early 20th century equivalent to the Army Corps of Engineers built five uh, floodways um, that enabled the land to then become agricultural land. So in the block, uh, she has all five of the drainage, um, the floodways there um, in Dunklin County, and then all of the various um, kinds of agricultural products they do. So watermelon, cantaloupe, peanuts, potatoes, um, corn, um, shows some farming, shows the ducks, um, and it's just beautifully put together from all these really tiny, tiny pieces. Um, and then at the bottom, um, are from our oldest quilter, who is uh, Mary McMorris uh, in Monroe County, um, to represent that county and sort of naming off these important aspects. Um, the, blo the blocks are fairly challenging. They had to finish it six by six. Um, so they're not really big canvases. Um, but a number of quilters were able to just achieve, I think, a, just beautiful art with them um, while, again, sort of expressing some story about the county and, and, and um, what makes it special and unique. Um, what was kind of exciting about this also is that the quilt project uh, encouraged other counties to make their own bicentennial related quilts. Uh, on the screen on the left side, you'll see the Texas County quilt. I mentioned Texas County was one of the counties that sent us in the most blocks. Um, so blocks that were not used, we sent back to Texas County and they were incorporated into this Texas County quilt uh, along with a number of other blocks. Uh, and then on the right is uh, the Phelps County quilt. Um, that's there documenting the history of Phelps County uh, from a small quilting group there in Phelps County. Uh, I believe Ray County is also going to be putting together a quilt. So there's a number of these that emerged um, out of this larger bicentennial quilt project. Um, two other additional projects that, that are underway, Missouri State Parks is going to be doing a bicentennial quilt um, that features all of their different state parks. And then 4-H is working on one um, from each of its different um, regions of the state. And all of these are going to be available for sharing and viewing in, in 2021 in different ways. Uh, so it's neat that this bicentennial quilt project um, has helped inspire other examples. Um, I did mention we are trying really hard to get the quilt around the state. Um, and COVID has made that a challenge. So we have not really put out an entire quilt schedule. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our website and where you can find information about when we're traveling. And I've listed um, on the slide here some of the other locations that, that are pretty solid at this point, um, including Steelville coming up here at the end of the, end of the month, uh, Carothersville down the Boot Hill, Branson, Camdenton down by the Lake of the Ozarks, Warrensburg, uh, home to Central uh, Missouri State University, Cape Girardeau, Sedalia, um, with Missouri State Fair, St. Louis, um, Mansfield, um, home of Lauren Ingalls Wilder, uh, and then Savannah, Missouri, up in, in Northwest Missouri. Uh, but there will be additional sites as well. Um, as I mentioned, we do have a website, Missouri2021.org, your gateway to all things bicentennial. Um, on the website, we have placed all of the blocks uh, that we received, all 203, um, up on the website so you can view all of the entries and all of the descriptions that came with them. You'll also find on the website uh, information about the quilt schedule. We like, so we sort of update this about a month in advance uh, so people have a sense of where it's going. 
Um, in addition to that, we are on social media, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, as a person who did not have any of these before I started this job, um, I can say that they've become really important communication tools. When we do add additional dates for the quilt, this is the first place you will hear about them. Um, so I hope I would encourage you to, again, sort of check out those uh, social media platforms um, and join us and follow us. And that's a good way to sort of keep up to date on that. Um, that's kind of a broad sweep of this. I hope it's provided some insight into sort of how the quilt came together, um, what I think a bit of its significance is. And I look forward to questions and comments and, and further discussion. So my thanks, my thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Michael. Um, we had one question uh, come up uh, about where where can they see the quilt and and is there anywhere in the Kansas City region where you might be able to people might be able to see it coming um, up? We are going to work to try and get it back into Kansas City. It was early on supposed to be at the Kansas City Museum, and then the museum closed, and uh, it was going to be at three Mid Continent branches. Um, this month, actually in January, and, and due to COVID, that those had to be canceled um, as well. Um, again, I'm speaking as a Kansas City, and I would like to have a quilt on display in Kansas City. Um, so I'm going to work hard to sort of figure that out. Um, we're tentatively scheduled to be at the Kansas City Quilt Show, I believe, in June, um, which is actually over at Overland Park, the Kansas City Regional um, Quilt Show. So it will be there in June. Um, but again, the best thing you can do is sort of follow us on social media because as those things come up and those opportunities come up and sometimes they come up quick, um, that is where you'll most likely learn about that. And the best place now is uh, to to look at uh, your website, Missouri2021.org, right? Yeah, right now. Uh, we should be putting up a February schedule here in the next week or so. Um, we're trying to re-solidify some dates again. It's one of those things that we think dates are in place and then a couple weeks out people are like yeah we're still not open um so that's made it a little difficult and if if they go to the website will they be able to uh, contact you by email yes yeah, so you'll find the contact information there and it's pretty simple it's contact at missouri 2021.org okay perfect excellent thanks for that question yeah and thanks again michael and now uh Lisa, Dr. Lisa Higgins from the Missouri Folk Arts Program. Uh, welcome. Thank you. And people will be able to contact you by email as well, right? Absolutely. Okay, through the Folk, Art, Folk Arts Program website? We do. <clears throat> That's not as easy to memorize as um, Michael's is. It's Mo Folk Arts dot missouri dot edu all right i will put that in the chat while you're talking and so your your powerpoint's ready to go and i'm gonna load it in right now great thank you thank you all right well thanks first of all for the invitation to come and talk about quilts uh, i want to make sure that everybody knows at the very beginning that i am not a quilt expert i'm not a quilt scholar but I have this incredibly wonderful job where I get to meet with all kinds of traditional artists from around the state, from many communities. I've been with the Folk Arts Program this time for about 21 years. And previous to that, I was a, a student worker here uh, with my predecessors. So I've gotten to know uh, quite a few artists as well as uh, a few quilters. I wanted to really uh, basically tell you about some of them, uh, knowing full well that that's that these are just a few of those folks. Originally, we had planned to have this uh, event in person, of course, and my intention then was just to bring some quilters along, invite some quilters that we know and from the area to come in and have a conversation. Uh, of course, here we are uh, on a live stream. So I'll try to introduce you and also share some voices of some quilters that are, are still around or who have uh, won major awards in our state. Um, as I said, I'm not a quilter, um, but I have, uh, this is a, one of my mamas quilts, my paternal grandmother's quilts. It's something that I laid under and I laid upon when I was a child. I know in a pallet on the floor in the dining room when we stayed over, uh, these are quilts. I have a few quilts that, uh, came to my family 
my father and my mother and have come to me for safekeeping until they go on to the next ones in our family. Uh, also, um, and I'll say these are Arkansas quilts since I'm from Arkansas originally. Um, and uh, both my grandmothers were quilters. My mom has told me many stories as a child that they actually had the quilt rack that some of you all may have heard about or even know about that hung over the their uh, uh, dining table. And after the food was put away, it came down and they would stitch um, at that. My grandmother and some of the kids maybe or uh, extended family and friends. So uh, I want to introduce you to a few quilters that we've met through the folk arts program. I should back up a little bit and say that the Missouri Folk Arts Program is a program of the Missouri Arts Council. That's our statewide arts agency. And uh, we're based at the University of Missouri at the Museum of Art and Archaeology and have been um, for quite some time. Well, in all of its iterations, the Missouri Folk Arts Program has been based at the university. So that gives us a central location to uh, go out and, and visit with artists. We have a few key programs, and one of those is grant making through the Arts Council. We work with small and large, medium and large organizations on uh, grants for projects. And we also have a traditional arts apprenticeship program. We're in the 36th year of that apprenticeship program, which is where we've met so many of the artists that we've met, including the quilters. I want to start, though, with Mabel Murphy. Um, who was from Fulton. Uh, and Mrs. Murphy was in just an incredible and a prolific quilter. She passed in 2002, uh, but before that time in 1989, she was awarded a National Heritage Fellowship, which is, uh, we jokingly in the field of folk arts refer to it sort of as the Oscars of folk and traditional arts. It's a big deal. And she got to go with the other awardees to Washington, D.C. And there's always a concert uh, with the awardees that are presented on stage. They also have a dinner the evening before where they meet, have a beautiful dinner and meet legislators, Congress people, and, um, and sometimes meet and record their stories. Uh, as you can see, uh, some of you may recognize Charles Kuralt there on the right, and he was the host at that point. So I'm just gonna play this small clip uh, that sits on the uh, website of uh, docu Documentary Arts, um, has uh, compiled a page for all of the uh, Heritage Fellows. So here's a short video with Mrs. Murphy. One morning I was reading in the Bible about the rainbow in Genesis, and I thought, oh, God has never created anything as beautiful as the rainbow, unless it was a sunrise or sunset. And I thought, if I will use three shades of the same color, I can do a rainbow. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. This is not the uh, Genesis rainbow, but it is the Murphy rainbow. Maybe we'll, let me uh, spread it out and let's take a little bit of a look at it. I noticed that uh, that you take your time. You you have little tiny stitches. You can almost I've thought sometimes that you could almost judge uh, the quality of quilts by how much patience they were made with. Well, that's the truth. Uh, I was told a long time ago that a good quilter gets nine stitches to the inch, and I just pass that good information along, and we're all working on it. <laughs> <laughs> So as I said, you can go to um, the website for Documentary Arts and take a look. Uh, her, her daughters, much as I hold on to my, some of my grandmother's quilts, her daughters have uh, inherited the quilts from, her, uh, from their mother. And um, there are several photos there and details of the quilts, many of the quilts that she made. The next uh, quilter that I want to introduce you to is Malverna Richardson, who was from Beverly Hills, Missouri. Um, she unfortunately has also passed. She died in 1992, but before she did that, she was uh, quite well known as an African-American quilter, as a quilter in general. And uh, she um, participated in our traditional arts apprenticeship program in 1987. Uh, and uh, this is interesting, These uh, the quilts, I'm going to tell you about a, a quilt scholar a little bit later. Uh, I guess uh, one of the, there were some sort of 
beliefs or understandings or that weren't necessarily true across the board about African American women and their quilts. But with Mal, there's a great story from Mrs. Richardson about um, these flower garden quilts and the hexagons that were that occur in them and uh, sort of an understanding which she disputed later about the size that they use these really tiny hexagons. And uh, at some point she decided just to throw that uh, caution to the wind and started making giant hexagons because she was getting older and she said it, took, it was much quicker a uh, process for her. But you can see there's a beautiful quilt that she's made. Um, more recently, we had uh, Barbara Culpepper from Van Buren, Missouri, who was a quilter uh, in the program and taught and passed that tradition on. Two things that are, to me, particularly interesting about Mrs. Culpepper is that she and her husband worked very closely together, almost as a well as a team in their quilting. And um, I think a lot of, I think a lot of quilters, it's a process that we think of maybe as it about individuals, but to me really is about um, friendship and fellowship and family and people coming together at one point or the other in the quilting process to, to finish one or to share one. And so this is, I said, a pro when she was in the program, she was the master artist and she had an apprentice, but as we came to know them better, we understand that she and Ray Culpepper, her husband, worked very closely together on these. She was also someone who had quite a few of the um, uh, patterns as a, as a younger woman and in her family, they would get those Kansas City Star newspaper uh, patterns, but they would trace them out on uh, cereal boxes and cut those out and she had those and she still used those and referred to them, recut them as they got worn. And so that, um, was one of the more and one of the and many interesting things about her and her quilting. She also uh, she and her husband worked together and put together some uh, beginning uh, quilt making kits for kids that they used to sell to families. Um, this is if you look in this picture at the top, the women that are at the top of this beautiful uh, quilt. That's Patty Tapper, uh, Patty Tapple. Uh, in the red t-shirt, the long hair and the glasses. She has not been in our apprenticeship program. Her husband, Bernie Tapple, is a blacksmith. And that's how we first met um, Patty because Bernie was uh, actually was a master blacksmith in the program and taught someone else. And we've gotten to know them quite a bit over the years. Um, always following her. She has a blog and um, she has Instagram. She is always uh, working on something. She also has an incredible collection of uh, sewing machines, those that she actually uses. I think they're all working, but uh, they go back, you know, uh, hundreds, hundred years or more. And uh, my favorites are the mid-century ones that look like something out of a space station. But uh, she's known for paper piecing, but she's also to me known for the fellowship uh, with the women uh, at her St. Margaret's uh, parish. Uh, there at, at Osage Bend. The women work all year long on these tops, these quilt tops, but they get together regularly to, uh, to uh, quilt them. And then they have an auction every August and uh, to auction them off for the building fund for their church. This quilt, they were really trying to uh, raise quite a bit of money for some particular project. And so Patty went all out. Now, again, she's a paper piece quilter. Those are tiny, tiny pieces that she often works with. And so she came up with this top um, and at the auction in uh, 2017, it raised $5,000 for their church. Now this is Lois Mueller and Mrs. Mueller actually should be earlier in the slideshow if we're going chronologically. I have her placed here uh, for a reason. Uh, but she was uh, in Glendale, sort of metro Kansas City, and later in, uh, lived in New Haven. And if, if anybody's uh, uh, familiar with that area, she and her husband actually opened a winery, um, which is still there. And she was very involved uh, with a group called Friends, uh, Missouri Friends of the Folk Arts, was, which was an all-volunteer nonprofit group. And they staged a... Uh, festival every year for many years under the arch was called the Frontier Folklife Festival. That's the picture in the right bottom right corner is her demonstrating at that festival. 
Um, and that quilt, I understand from people who were there, was one that she was making for her son who was going away from college. It was a surprise, going away to college. That was a surprise for him. Um, they talked about the fact that the compass, the mariner's compass in the middle, was an important thing for her to include because she wanted to make sure that he always could find his way home. That was the message that he was, uh, she was trying to send to him. And then um, in the upper uh, left corner is more recent photo from 2015 where uh, she joined us in St. Louis for a special event we had to celebrate 30 years of that apprenticeship program, which as you can see in 1989 and 1990, she was a participant. Uh, but I, I think if you also can kind of see, it looks like the uh, compass is, is a motif that recurs for her quite a bit. Those are a few uh, folks that I can introduce you to. I want to tell you a little bit also about some resources, one resource in particular. I hope uh, this is new to you. Uh, it's someplace that I can spend quite a few minutes and probably hours on if I have the, uh, t the time. It's a rabbit hole that I go down every once in a while. This is the quilt index uh, that you see here. It's a, pro it's a program at Michigan State University and um, they have documented in partnership with different states and individual quilting groups and individuals, they have documented a number of quilts around the country. And so what you're seeing on the screen here is just my search. It's a screenshot of my search for Missouri in the quilt index. And there are 367 results there, um, which is just fascinating to me. Um, and just to, to kind of look at all the different patterns, you can see they're often uh, by name, the double welding ring, of course, a basket, a Dresden plate. And, um, <clears throat> The one that is featured more prominently here is one that was designed by, and this is why I positioned Lois Mueller where I did, it's close to this quilt by Cuesta Benberry. And Miss Benberry was not a quilter so much as she was a, uh, an African-American quilt scholar, something that she came to a little bit later um, through her husband and her husband's family who were quilters. And um, she designed this quilt. And if you, I don't, you can't see it in the description here, but this is one that um, Lois Mueller was one of the three folks who worked on this quilt together. And this is sort of a sampler. Uh, if I get a chance later, I'll switch screens and maybe be able to show you the whole thing. But it's the notion here is that each square is one that's representative of things that are metaphorically, or well, there are metaphors for things that are important to African-American women in their lives. All right. And then I think we know, everybody thinks, well, we know what a quilt is, what it looks like. Uh, I think we all basically know it's a sandwich of material and the original intent, of course, was function, but they've always has, there's always been an aesthetic associated with them. But those, um, there's, we know just from our own, I think we all know from our own experiences, the various kinds of, like I said, the, the dynamism in the tradition um, with art quilters, with new patterns, with new fabrics, with old fabrics, um, and all kinds of innovations that people take on. On a couple of newer things in terms of innovation, uh, the Boonslick Area Tourism Council, which serves uh, Cooper, Howard, and Saline counties, uh, came up with a project a few years ago that they borrowed from some other states, this barn quilt tour Kentucky and Ohio were, Ohio were two states that had uh, barn quilt projects originally. Um, the folks in Boone Slick actually had gone to Grundy County, Iowa and gone on their tour and then decided to try to implement a barn quilt tour in those three counties that they served. Uh, the goal was to have, and I think they're close if they haven't achieved it already, to having 20 uh, quilt squares on barns that are visible from the from the paved road 
uh, in those counties. This is one that's in Cooper County. This happens to be one of my personal favorites. Um, the colors, the actually the home is across the street. The colors that they've chosen uh, have uh, tie into the house uh, that's across the street. This is a partnership between the Tourism Council, but also the barn owners. They get to choose the patterns. They actually work really closely with a quilter in order to like who has this massive uh, binder of quilt patterns. And they talk about either things that have been important to a family, like a one woman chose a far farmer's daughter uh, quilt pattern, quilt square for her barn because she was in fact, she is a farmer's daughter. This is a really cool, I've, I've kind of driven around myself a, a few times. I recommend this as a fun tour for people. It's something that I did back in April uh, to get out of the house and <laughs> uh safely and not have to interact with people so much but just you know to get out it's a beautiful time of year it was a great day to be able to drive around those three counties and i didn't see all of them by any means um but i enjoy this quite a bit i understand that there's a, a new video coming out soon of these barn of the barn tour that uh, was taken with a drone so i'm looking forward to uh sharing information about that on our social media in the near future Another innovation, I think everyone probably remembers back in the spring where um, mask and personal pr uh, protective equipment was scarce. There was a, certainly a need to keep that, uh, you know, the masks for essential workers, for medical workers. And so, and in fact, there was scarcity there as well. We met uh, Andrea O'Brien of the Splintered Spool a few years ago in a project where we were working to identify artists that were new to us and in fact in that in that area north of i-70 basically sort of central north uh we met folks from three or four different quilting groups um and and andrea and i have been in touch off and on over the years i follow her also on in instagram notice that she was i as i understood it she was making masks um, and as also you can hear see here a surgical cap uh, when I contacted her and said I was writing uh, a little essay about this you know, quilter's response to the pandemic and asked if I could use a photo and she would tell me more about it she said to make sure that everyone understood that this wasn't that something that she had done alone it was something that she had done in sort of a 21st century quilting group um, they stayed connected online because they couldn't meet in person uh, during the state shutdown, for instance. They used Google Docs um, in order to keep track of the requests that they'd have from various facilities or groups that needed masks or, or surgical caps. And they uh, also the materials that they needed that they had and that were donated. They actually were to get, able to get quite a few donations. So um, even though these obviously don't look like quilts. Some of my favorite masks that, that I have, and I've got a collection now, have actually come from uh, some young sewers, uh, teenagers and pre-teens who've been working uh, and learning from members of their family, quilters and other seamstresses. I want to end with, seemed appropriate in a talk from for the Story Center to end with a storyteller. And last year, no, 2019, um, the Missouri Arts Council held a special convening, a conference about arts and aging and um, basically engaging people, our elders in the arts and also recognizing them for, for the artists that they, that they are. Uh, we invited Deb Swanigan, the Folk Arts Program invited Deb Swanigan to be a presenter. And I just told her she had 10 minutes and I knew she would do a great job. And I had no idea that it was actually going to, her pr presentation was going to focus on quilting. You'll notice, by the way, just in this frozen frame that her, she doesn't even talk about her vest, which is sewn of the little yo-yo pieces. So if you'll bear with me, I'm going to advance because we don't have enough time 
to watch the whole thing. I'm going to advance to 340 or close. <laughs> In 1820, the first person ever in my family, an enslaved woman, escaped with this quilt. This quilt, believe it or not, contains fabric from the Duvalier family who owned Belle Reve in Louisiana. And if you look at all of these pieces, believe this or not, this is a wedding dress. Since my ancestor had to help do this quilt and use pieces from the mistress's um, uh, wedding dress and from wedding pants and from work clothes, when she escaped the Belle Reeve at 13, she thought she should take it with her. Mm-hmm. And um, absolutely. She wrapped her baby up in it, got a riverboat up the Mississippi River, met a handsome Cherokee gentleman. Mm -hmm. And the story, of course, continues all the way up to Missouri. During the Civil War, this quilt covered a Civil War soldier who was helping some of our ancestors escape in the Underground Railroad. Today, it has a place of honor, like many of your quilts do, in our treasure room. And every young person, myself included, who is newly married gets to sleep under this quilt. When we have a baby that's being christened, we wrap them in this quilt. This quilt has so much meaning. This is the substance, the signature, if you will, of our hearts and of our souls of our family. And many times when we have elders, those things are like, <clears throat> we don't wanna care, but I'll tell you, Elders are a treasure. They make things like this. They have meaning. And in your programs, wherever you are, hopefully they'll get you, they'll get you to talk to them about that. On the bottom, I don't know about you, the tradition has been when a young person becomes engaged, young ladies declare a pattern. And all the ladies in our family and in our community bring their favorite fabric pieces and they start making that pattern. The Dresden plate was mine. And this one is a particular favorite. I'm making this one for my daughter who is a 21 year breast cancer survivor. Yeah. She has a quilt already. I'm just celebrating because she's my child. All right. So during the time that my quilt was being made, I sat with the elder ladies. It's amazing what you can hear. I learned about meanings of life. Mm -hmm. And child, a hard head make a soft behind. And child, and of course you heard stories. Uncle Billy sat over there mm -hmm, and he told us how you dehorn mules. <laughs> what? He was actually saying, watch out, because when things change in your marriage, it's probably because somebody's stepping out on you. Mm -hmm, that's exactly right. And so, you know, we, we, we heard things that made a lot of, didn't make a whole lot of sense. Like, you know, women, you should never buy a man a pair of shoes because he'll walk out on you. <laughs> You should never wear any yellow face powder. And Lord child, don't you ever wear red lipstick, red nail polish, and open-toed shoes because it was supposed to drive a man to lust. Who <laughs> knew? And so in these sessions, you also got to hear things. And if there were children in the midst, you always knew there was because the elders would start to spell. And sometimes they didn't spell well, <laughs> but we kind of ignored that. But if children of the traditional arts apprenticeship program, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> do, do 
I hit the wrong button. He was actually saying, watch out, because when things change and you're married, it's probably because somebody's stepping out on you. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. And so, you know, we, we, we heard things that made a lot of, didn't make a whole lot of sense. Like, you know, women, you should never buy a man a pair of shoes because he'll walk out on you. You should never wear any yellow face powder. And Lord child, don't you ever wear red lipstick, red nail polish, and open-toed shoes because it was supposed to drive a man to lust. Who <laughs> knew? And so in these sessions, you also got to hear things. And if there were children in the midst, you always knew there was because the elders would start to spell. And sometimes they didn't spell well. <laughs> But we kind of ignored that. But if children were in the midst, they would say, Marietta, girl, I would tell you, but T-H-E, T-H-I-S, and T-H-A-T are in this room. <laughs> and you knew the conversation was to be carried on later. Quilt making, though, extends not only to fabric. Every single one of us is a quilt piece. There's a reason that we're in this room together today. Sometimes we fit in an orderly fashion like this, and sometimes we're a crazy quilt, but we're a quilt. For good, worse, or better, we're a quilt. And passion goes into all of these, and the painstaking expertise that comes from that older generation after generation after generation is a part of who we are and we forget that sometimes each one of us is a masterpiece unique and wonderful i will send you all the links so you can watch the whole thing but that seemed to me when I was planning this talk, the best way to, the best place to stop. Um, I think just for this sampling of folks, we can see how important uh, something that seems like an inanimate object is that they represent faith and family, and friendship and freedom from many uh, different perspectives and many different generations. So it seems like a good time to stop, maybe have a little conversation and questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Lisa. Uh, we had a couple of questions come in, so I want to invite people to uh, send in your questions, and we will relay those to Michael and Lisa. Lisa, a question for you. Can you tell us about the quilt behind you? Yes. Yeah, so I can't tell you a lot about the quilt behind me, uh, um, but I can tell you that was made by my Mama Inez, and uh, it's one of those quilts that I'm almost certain that I slept under or on as a child. Uh, she was, uh, my, my mother tells me, this is my father's mom, but my mom knows all the stories, and she told me that uh, Mama Inez would always piece them, and I think you can see, uh, I'll try to move which direction here, this is... Um, I mean, this is definitely one of those quilts that's made from shirts and dresses and tops from the family. Um, and she would piece them, but then she had some ladies that she would take them to and pay them to quilt. Uh, this is like probably around the 70s at that point. So that's where that's from. It's cherished by me. All right, Michael, uh, there's a... A question here for you as well um, from Connie. Will there be a book about the quilt and the block stories? Yeah, so far, it is not in the stars for that to happen, unfortunately. Um, right now, all the stories that we did receive about the blocks you can find on the website with each with each block there we pretty much took stuff verbatim from the submission forms we received in terms of trying to do a book it has been an issue of as it is for many people labor and funding 
um, to make something like that go. Um, there may be something in the future coming down the road, but right now there's nothing kind of set for that project. Okay. Can I say that I had the opportunity to go over in December and meet uh, Michael when he installed the the quilt, the bicentennial quilt at the Hotel Frederick. And um, interestingly, the, whole, the bicentennial quilt was on one side of the room and a quilt that the Boonslick Tourism had uh, made of some of the quilt blocks that had barn quilt box was on the other side of the room. But I have to tell you all that you get the chance to like, look, you know, find that quilt when it's nearby because it is incredibly impressive to see in person. You did great work, Michael. As well, did all I, did not, I did not do great work. Lots of people out in the state did amazing work. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I actually have, I have a question for Lisa, just as a, as a point of, of conversation. Um, there were sort of two things that sort of stood out in, in your talk. One was very much sort of the social aspect of quilting mm -hmm. um, in multiple ways as manifestations of family, mm -hmm. um, as a social practice of passing traditions down, um, the area of the tourism, right? Um, sort of all these things that, that as an object bring people together. Um, the thing with that, and, and kind of the other question it prompted was, and, and I don't have an answer to this, so maybe you do, is do, do you think there's a Missouri quilting tradition? Do people identify as Missouri quilters, do you think? Gosh, Michael, you know, I, I was just writing for those uh, in the audience. I was just writing about meeting Michael and sort of the culmination of our, our uh, knowing of each other, I think since August of 2017. And I think that's a question that you asked me way back then. Yeah. And I, I don't I don't think that I could identify a Missouri tradition. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm trained as a folklorist. And um, even if I weren't, I can see I can compare this this grandmother's quilts with my maternal grandmother's quilts. Uh, they lived, you know, blocks from each other mm -hmm. in my hometown. And and there, there were similarities in that it's a sandwich of material. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of patterns or function and materials that they chose to use, right. whatever, it was different. Um, yeah. I have recently come to enjoy um, art, more art quilts. Mm -hmm. You know, I was pretty, I was kind of a traditionalist because this is what I grew up with. Um, but I have friends, uh, Eric Wolf, who's in Iowa, uh, and Kathy Fussell, who's in Georgia. Uh, I have a friend who's now deceased, V. Kingsley, who was in California, who have really taken um, the quilting tradition and manifested a uh, story still, and, you know, mm -hmm. but in really contemporary ways that I've come to admire. So I think it's hard to say, but I mean, maybe there is. We, we should ask the quilters that, not me. Oh, one last thing, and then I'll then I'll let other people um, yeah. chime in. But that that aspect of story, I think, is this other interesting social aspect of this. Mm -hmm. I know we when we were talking together about the bison the bicentennial quilt, it really is very much this story quilt. Let me tell you something about my county or or yeah. whatnot. Yeah. Um, this being this other thing that sort of draws people together into conversation, and again, sort of fabric as this mechanism of storytelling. Um, I think is really exciting. So. Yeah. Can, Michael, can you give one example from that that's really memorable in, in your work? I know you've traveled to every county in the state um, for this project, not only for the quilt project, but for the, the entire bicentennial. But is there a particular story uh, that's reflected in one of those blocks that's in the bicentennial quilt that you will, that really sticks with you? Sure. Well, and so, so I mean, the first piece before you get to the story is the story you choose to represent. Um, the county, right? The story is meant to tell you something about right the county. There's always all kinds of things that we're not people are surprised people no one included that. Well, that's sometimes a thing. One that does stand out for just for being included. Um, and it was a an actually Jackson County quilter that did this, Robin um Craig, who did, did amazing work and did a number of blocks for the quilt, did one for Lewis County, which is um the birthplace of a woman named Ella Ewing. Um, and she pictures Ella Ewing um, kind of standing there with her, her parents. The important thing to know about Ella Ewing is she was eight feet tall with a couple inches, uh, generally referred to as the Missouri giantess, um, a woman who by all accounts was very shy, of course, because she's very tall, and people point her out. Um, her father became ill and was unable to take care of the farm, and so she realized she could provide for the family by 
joining the freak show and joining the circus and doing actually all these things she really did not want to do. Um, and through that, those, those efforts was able to then provide for her family, bought them a lovely farm, took care of them the rest of their life. But right, this idea of this, this person is kind of the one who is standing in for Lewis County as sort of this heroic figure. Um, I think that's a really good example of a story. Again, it's an image, but it's, it's built on this, this entire, this bigger story. Um, yeah, I, that's, that's one example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Marilyn, uh, wrote, uh, I saw a half of an old quilt at a museum exhibit several years ago. The story was that two sisters could not agree on who would inherit the quilt, so they cut it in half. <laughs> Have you ever heard a story like that? No, that's a good, well, I mean, there's a biblical story like that, right? <laughs> it's not a quilt, it's just it's something important to a family, <laughs> the child, but <laughs> that's great. You know, I, I also see a comment from Gladys Cogswell here in the in the in the chat over on the side. I should point out that we Deb Swanigan, who we're talking about as a quilter, was and as a storyteller, she was an apprentice uh, to Gladys Cogswell, one of many uh, apprentices that Gladys has had in the traditional arts apprenticeship program. But Gladys also mentioned um, she did a school residency in Boonville uh, for us. Uh, I'm going to say maybe 2005. Don't quote me. Um, and which one of the things that she did with the kids, they they did a score, story quilt. Each of them drew on a, a square and uh, they were able to, to determine the layout. And then Gladys found a quilter. I think she was local who put that together. And it, Gladys would have to tell us in the comments where that quilt lives these days. Is it in, is it in Boonville or is it at the State Historical Society? We didn't even get at story quilts. Yeah. You know, there's some fantastic ones. I think some of the ones that Cuesta Benberry had documented were definitely in that tradition. So go to the quilt index and, and search for story quilts. <laughs> okay, well, well, we uh, keep our eyes out for the, the chat and answer to that question about where the quilt is. And another, uh, Sherry, I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, wrote, I noticed one of the bicentennial quilt blocks was a cabin. Uh -huh. Which county was that from? And can you tell us that story? There's actually a number of cabins <laughs> on, on the quilt, uh, including the log cabin uh, in Innsbruck, representing uh, Warren County. Um, you will also find a cabin, I believe, in the Clinton County block, um, basically trying to, as, as part of a larger agricultural scene. Um, so there's a number of number of cabin-like structures um, on the quilt. Um, I'm not sure which one in particular um, Sherry was thinking about, but um, yeah. All right, and, and we did hear from Gladys again. She says, I think it's still at the school. I'll follow up with them. Glad I'll follow up with Gladys, and we'll follow up with the school and see if we can get documentation. Okay. <laughs> I iPhone picture. See if it's how it looks. Near the top of the center. So uh, another question about as we're nearing our time together, the end of our time together, at least for this for this presentation, uh, where can we see this video? Uh, so this video will be. Uh, available on the, the uh, Story Center Facebook page for you to watch again. Uh, that's where it will live. And then we'll also plan on archiving it on the Mid-Continent Public Library YouTube channel. So it'll be in both of those places available for you to watch. Um, got a nice uh, uh, comment from E. Lewis Lewis. Great presentation. As a new textile artist, this is engaging and empowering. I have a textile quilt exhibit on display at the Bunker Center for the Arts until the end of the month, and I'm here in Kansas City. So, um, would are there any more questions? We're happy to to uh, take some more questions while we're here. And Michael, you had to, uh, there's some, some <laughs> thought about the DeKalb County 
Courthouse. Terry, I, I, I think the one you're thinking you're looking at um, is the one for DeKalb County. Uh, and what it actually is featuring is their first courthouse, which is this very log cabin looking structure. Um, that's what that what that is. Um, and I wish I would have a convenient way to pull it up, but I think that's the one you're one you're thinking about. One of the things that I Lisa has heard me talk about this. Um, I know little to nothing about quilting before I, I started down this path. And um, so I learned some things along the way. Uh, a number of the blocks on the Bicentennial quilt do include the county name, uh, but a lot of them did not. And it was not a requirement. And if I was doing this again, which I am never doing again, uh, I would require people to put the county name on the block. Uh, but we do, but you can find all the county names on the website with, with each of their blocks. So, Great. And, and Marilyn just uh, posted a link to a video uh, for a story for an art and stories project with the Visions Art Museum in San Diego. So we have uh, kind of a nationwide uh, connection there. So thank you for posting that. Uh, happy to, to take a few more questions. What I'm going to do is... Uh, Say thanks again to to Michael and Lisa for being here and uh, sharing your expertise and your knowledge and your experiences. Um, I would like to thank the the Kaufman Foundation and the Kemper Foundation for funding these uh, State of Stories programs. And if you're interested in uh, additional State of Stories programs, please take a look at the web page for State of Stories programming, which is available on the Story Center website. And we also would ask that you take a few minutes uh, and fill out a, an evaluation for the program, which I'm going to drop in the chat right now. If you could provide some feedback, we would appreciate that. And invite you to stay in touch uh, with the Story Center and, and more of these programs. And also keep your eyes peeled for when the Bicentennial Quilt will be visiting you and take a look at the the bicentennial quilt online in the meantime michael that's the web address is is missouri 2021.org missouri 21 2021.org and also take at the a look at the missouri folk arts program website and, and keep in touch with what they're up to so yes. thank you both for being here and thank you everybody for joining us tonight and uh keep in touch all right thank you enjoyed it thanks mark Thank you. Bye. Good night. Bye.